Right, uh, good afternoon. Now, uh, today we are going to uh, conduct the 11th lecture of uh, international, uh, financial, inter international finance. So, uh, now before starting the today's topic, uh, I thought to give you some uh, information regarding your assignment. Now, next week you need to uh, submit your assignment um, on 18th. So, uh, that means all the information you can now find on the uh, top of the LMS page, right? You can see the individual assignment and you can read all the information. Now, this assignment is about uh, balance of payment, right? In your assignment, what you're supposed to do is you need to analyze uh, BOP data, balance of payment data, and popular exchange rates. Now, here in the uh, in your assignment, we have given uh, dollars or pound. You can incorporate another one or two popular exchange rates. And you need to collect data for the period of 2005 to 2015. Right? And collect uh, data related to exchange rates and collect data uh, related to balance of payments. Now, balance of payments data uh, include uh, trade balance, current balance and uh, financial and accounting balance, right? So those are the key components of uh, data uh, points in the balance of payment. Then you need to analyze these two data sets, right? One is uh, data set relating to balance of payment. Other one is a data set relating to exchange rate. Okay. Now, you have, uh, separately you can analyze these two data sets, like uh, now you can analyze balance of payment data, right? Uh, so what is the trend relating to uh, trade balance and what is the trend related to current account balance whether it, it is a decreasing or de increasing right so analyze the trend you can analyze the trend related to balance of payment data and you can analyze the trend related to exchange rates right whether currencies are appreciating and depreciation because if you are taking uh, let's say four currencies the trend may be different right one currency may be depreciating, one currency may be appreciating. So likewise, you can analyze uh, balance of payment data and um, uh, exchange rate data separately. Then you can combine those two data sets and identify the impact of balance of payment to exchange rate determination. Right? So what is the condition of balance of payment and what is the condition in exchange rate. Likewise, you can combine the data set and try to develop some conclusions uh, by using your data, right? So that is what basically what you have to do. So apart from that, think a little bit and try to add some uh, more things, right? You can, you can read uh, some articles and you can search in the web, right? So all the things. Now, uh, in the uh, latter part of the document, you have given the format, what should be the format of your report. Right? So in that case, uh, you need to follow that format because we will be giving marks. We, we have assigned marks for that format, right? especially relating to that uh, references. Okay? So if you uh, refer a book or if you refer uh, to a website, all the references you need to mention. Okay? So likewise, uh, you have to complete your report. Okay, so those are the basic information related to your assignment. So deadline is 18th uh, February. Okay, next week you have to submit your assignment. So I have already uh, added a Dropbox. You need to upload your document to the Dropbox, right? So uh, try to finish up, uh, finish that task within this week. Okay, so do not send mails or whatever. So we will be checking the Dropbox, right, after the deadline. Okay, so that is about your assignment. So, um, if you come to the today's topic, right, it is, um, the topic is derivatives, right? So, I'll be conducting this topic for uh, next, uh, that in, in two sessions, next, next week also you will be having the second part of derivatives. So uh, actually, we, we, we have talked a little bit about this topic when we are talking about uh, exchange rate exposure. So now, from this uh, two sessions, I'll be uh, covering up some theoretical aspects, right? 
Now in um, uh, investment and portfolio management also you are having this topic and you will be doing more calculations in that lecture, right? In, uh, in your next lecture, derivatives. In that lecture, you will be doing uh, calculations. Now, from this uh, part, I'll be covering some theoretical aspects about this derivative, right? Okay. Now, um, so when we are talking about derivatives, now you can see the topic hedging. Okay. Derivatives are for the hedging purpose. Now, we we'll see what do you mean by hedging. Um, now you can see the definition, right? Hedging is uh, reducing a firm's exposure to price or rate fluctuations is called hedging. Okay, now here you can see we are focused on two things. That means price fluctuations and rate fluctuations. So I'll be explaining what you mean by this price fluctuations and rate fluctuations in the next slide. Okay, now here the... Uh, now, hedging means we are reducing the firm's exposure. Now, here exposure means it's a risk, right? We are trying to reduce the risk of price and rate fluctuations. So, that is the simple meaning of hedging. Right? Okay. Now, we have different types and techniques of hedging. Okay. So, this derivatives is uh, a one type of hedging technique, right? Corporate risk management often involves buying and selling of derivative securities, right? So when we are talking about hedging, right? For the hedging, we are using derivatives as a technique. Okay, so if we see the definition of the derivative, it's a financial asset that represents a claim to another financial asset. Okay, so this is a financial asset. Okay, and it represents a claim to another financial asset. Now, as example, now uh, we have talked about these things a little bit when we are talking about foreign exchange rate exposure, forward contracts, option, futures, and swaps. So these are the four basic uh, uh, types of derivatives that we are going to talk. Now, if we think about a forward contract, okay, now. Let's say person A uh, is entering into a forward contract uh, with B to deliver some goods, right, on a few, uh, specific date in future. And B how to deliver money, right? Now A, that means this forward contract is a financial asset, okay? That means financial asset came to another financial asset. Now here one is delivering goods and other one is delivering money okay so that, that's why it said it's a financial asset that represents a claim to another financial asset now this uh, if we enter into a derivative contract right that one uh, the b is knowing that he will receive goods in near, in that future date so it's an asset and a is knowing that he will receive money in that future specific day okay so that is the meaning of uh, financial asset that represent a claim to another financial asset. Right. Now we are using, in a, in a business, we are using these derivatives to cover up three specific areas, three specific risk areas. Okay. So those are interest rate, exchange rate and commodity prices. So these are the three main risk areas of a business. That means a business can face to a risk due to fluctuations in interest rate. And on the other hand, businesses can uh, face to some risk due to exchange rate movements. On the other hand, the organizations are facing or exposed to a risk due to fluctuations in prices, commodity prices. Now, if we put that into a diagram, okay, it, uh, it is like this. Now, you can see risk, basically two types, right? Uh, price uh, fluctuations and rate fluctuations. In the case of rate, rate, move, rate fluctuations means exchange rate and interest rate, okay? Now, if you can, uh, if 
you can go to the that mean uh, second slide we have talked about the hegemony the reducing exposure to price and rate fluctuations right now price means commodity prices rate fluctuations means it may be either exchange rate or interest rate clear right okay now here we'll uh, talk about the first one that mean commodity price volatility now commodity prices means the prices for basic goods and materials okay prices prices of uh, basic goods and materials are one of the major areas in which volatility has uh, increased now as example let's say oil prices okay oil prices now this 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 may be a material okay so oil fluctuations in oil prices okay so if or maybe gold maybe aluminium right or maybe a uh, corn wheat whatever right so if you are doing uh, uh, that mean large scale production by using these materials the commodity these price fluctuations are heavily impact your business okay the other one is uncertainty about future inflation rate what do you mean by inflation so those who are who have uh, joined online you can uh, oh sorry right okay now uh those who have joined online hope you can hear me because there is a request to increase the volume of the microphone okay uh kumar sire can you hear me now yes hope others can hear me yeah okay yeah okay online participants they can hear me right so i need your contribution okay now what do you mean by inflation so uh, so i can get the answers from the students who have physically participated but i like to get the contribution from the uh, students who have joined online uh, inflation okay inflation means what inflation rate so that mean i uh, governments are concerned about this inflation rate they try to reduce the inflation rate okay what do you mean by inflation yes increase yeah continuous increase in general price levels right so that is the mean of inflation continuous right increase in general price levels here now when we talk about inflation it's we are talking about a general price level not about the price of a specific product or a service right so you know how we are calculating the inflation rate right? by using a price index right uh, that mean in sri lanka we are using colombo consumer price index and we are taking the general price level yeah okay i got that thank you kumar sir um increasing general price now why this is uh, a risk area why uh, an organization should concern about inflation why it how it create a uh, create a risk for an organization increasing inflation yes why we should bother about inflation is it a matter is it a should we do something about this uh, or oh. yeah okay yeah it's uh, reduce the purchasing power correct yeah purchasing power means ability to purchase goods right so with the inflation inflation means increasing the price level if you have a fixed income and price of the product is increased it automatically reduces the the number of units you can purchase right now as example if your income is 1000 and price of the product is 10 you can purchase 1000 divided by 10 100 units right if price is 20 then we can purchase only 50 units right so it's reduce the purchasing power 
Okay, so we think with there, when there is an inflation, it will have an impact to the demand of our product or service, right? The demand will reduce. When there is a, 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 a decrease in reduce, definitely it will have an impact to our cash flows, right? Because sales income will reduce. And the other one is cost of the production, okay? It will increase the cost of the production because the, when there is increase in price level means sometimes the material price will increase and sometimes we have to increase the uh, wage, right, salary to, uh, cope, uh, to cope with that inflation. So because of those things, cost of the production will increase, right? So when there is, a, when there is an increase in the cost of the production, it also creates a risk because uh, now, when there is increase in cost, the simple thing is to increase the price, selling price. But the problem is we have issue with increasing the selling price. If we increase the selling price, we will reduce the demand because there is a negative relationship between price and quantity demand. Right? Therefore, what we have to do is we have to keep the same selling price by reducing our profit margin. Okay, So that is the other option. If we are not in a position to increase the selling price, what we have to do is we have to keep the same selling price, but we have to reduce the profit margin with the increase in, increase in cost, production cost. So likewise, this inflation, okay, or price volatility uh, is having a, a great impact to the business. So it's a risk area, right? It's a risk area. So that is about uh, price volatility. Now, here this graph showing the um, crude oil price, right? Now you can see how, uh, okay, now x axis is the time and y axis is uh, crude oil price, right? Uh, you can see how it has fluctuated. Now, this is just an example, one particular type of uh, uh, commodity, right? Now this is coming under materials, oil prices. It may be gold prices, aluminium, whatever, right? Now you can see how this has fluctuated. So these fluctuations are having an impact to the uh, organization. Now if we think, if we are talking about the hedging, hope you can remember the incident, right? Hedging uh, contract that mean um, uh, that mean we had an issue with this uh, hedging, right? Uh, hope you can remember that incident. So that is also related to this uh, oil, right? So now this is this graph is showing the uh, oil prices, how it has fluctuated, and the next graph is showing our intra, uh, inflation rate. Right now, currently we are having about 5.6 inflation rate. Inflation rate is about 5.6. And now you can see from this graph, right? how it has uh, fluctuated. Right now, the highest inflation rate uh, was uh, about 28%. It was, uh, that mean, uh, beginning in 2009, right? So this is the highest one we had, around 28%. And now you can see how it has fluctuated, right? So we can see there is uncertainty. We don't know what will be the inflation rate. Okay, so this is a risk area. Okay, now this is inflation rate in uh, Sri Lanka. Okay, so if we move to the next slide, interest rate. Okay, so next one is interest rate for That we first one we talk about price for price. And this is rate, rate quality under rate. We have talk, we are going to talk about two rates, interest rate and exchange rate. First one is interest rate. So why we should concern about interest rate? Now you can see in the slide, debt is a vital source of financing for corporations and interest rate are a key component of a firm's cost of capital, right? Now, I hope you can remember, that means the, the um, the sources of finance, okay? capital structure of a business. Okay? So what is the main two components of a capital structure? Debt and equity. Okay? So we can find, a find finance through debt or through equity. Okay? So if we, are talking, if we are thinking about the uh, equity, we have a cost of equity. 
if we have faculty non debt we have a cost of debt okay so interest rate it is relating to this cost of debt when increase interest rate is increasing our cost of debt will increase okay so i uh, hope you can remember that there is a, a negative relationship between interest rate and investment okay when interest rate is increasing that will demotivate investors because they need to pay high interest rate okay therefore now here when we are talking about interest rate basically if you go to the central bank uh, website you will be able to find basically we have three types of interest rate right that means treasury rate that risk free rate and uh, deposit rate and lending rate okay deposit rate and lending rate three types of uh, interest rate so under those that means especially uh, deposit rates again there are some classification classification fixed deposit and normal deposits like like and then lending rate also again uh, they, there are some classifications if you go to the central bank uh, website you will be able to find those data okay now here uh, key component of firm's cost of capital right hope you can remember how we calculate the cost of capital uh, of a firm when we are using both equity and debt what is that equation when we are in our capital structure imagine we have both debt and equity in that case what is the cost of capital how we calculate the cost of capital can you remember w a double yeah back right hope you can remember the equation can you write the, uh, yes cost of equity r e into weightage right how much we are using and we have to cost of debt do we have any adjustment here yes we have a tax adjustment on minus t right into okay t so this is the uh, cost of capital equation now here this part is the important right so why this interest rate important because of this part okay interest rate so therefore interest rate volatility is a key risk area for a business we should concern we should do something to uh, min minimize right now in in the case of risk we cannot eliminate this risk 100% okay now especially um, in the case of interest rate exchange rate those are what type of risk so how you how you have classify risk in uh, in when you are learning corporate finance systematic and unsystematic hope you can remember right so this interest rate exchange rate those are coming at systematic risk that mean we cannot eliminate right we cannot eliminate and systematic risk of course we can eliminate through proper diversification now here therefore this risk interest rate exchange rate we cannot eliminate but we can reduce by uh, following some techniques we can reduce up to a, a tolerable or um, acceptable level okay right so uh, now so this is the risk free rate now you can see how it has fluctuated by right now here we are having a, a risk free rate is 7 right okay. now in the case of risk free rate you can see the the graph is a little bit different right it has increased then uh, yeah that mean uh, so this are policy rate the government is deciding so when the policy rate those rates cannot be changed uh, frequently so if it is like that then it will create a problem policy rate means those are should those should fix for a, some period of time okay now um, 
now we are having a uh, uh, risk-free rate uh, is 7%, right? 7%. That means treasury rate, okay? okay? So you can go to the website and see the fluctuations of other types of interest rate, right? Especially lending rate. Okay, now the other one is exchange rate fluctuations. So I'm not going to dis uh, discuss that uh, exchange rate fluctuations here because we have uh, uh, learned about that by with the, with the help of graphs how exchange rate has fluctuated right okay therefore now we have discussed about three risk areas price fluctuate price interest rate exchange rate right so those are the three basic risk areas for a business therefore by using derivatives we are trying to reduce this uh, risk right Financial manager need to identify the types of price and rate fluctuations that have the greatest impact on the value of the firm. Now here, the risk is the impact of the value of the firm. Right? Hope you can remember how we have derived the value of the firm by using cash flows. Right? By using cash flows, by incorporating discount rate, we have derived the value of the firm. Now, from this price, interest rate, exchange rate fluctuations, we have a direct impact on cash flows of a business, right? If our cash flows are changing, means the value of the firm will change, right? If there is a change in the value of the firm, that is a risk, right? So, always we try to increase the value of the firm, right? So, that is the that is our target. We want to increase the value of the firm. If there is a reduction in the value of the firm, it's a risk. Right? It's a risk. Therefore, we always try to protect uh, the value of the firm. We try to increase the value of the firm. Right? So, when there is a signal that the value of the firm will, re will, will reduce in future, we have to do something and try to protect that one. Okay? Now, in this case, we are trying to develop a graph, special graph, that is called as risk profile, right? Risk profile, uh, we need to develop a risk profile. So, if we see the definition, what do you mean by this risk profile? A plot showing how the value of the firm is affected by changes in price or rates, okay? Now, this is a graph showing what will happen to the value of the firm with the changes in price or rates okay now here you can now this is like a, a sensitivity analysis can you remember the sensitivity analysis when you are talking about um, yes in corporate finance you you have learned about sensitivity that means we are changing one variable at a time and check what will happen to the NPV, right? And from that, we have uh, we have identified what is the most sensitive variable in uh, NPV estimation. So likewise, now here we have talked about price, interest rate, and exchange rate, right? We have to change price. Uh, that means we have to change one variable at a time. First, we'll change price. And we have to check what is the impact on firm value. Right? And we can develop a graph. Right? One axis change in price, one axis change in price, change in firm. Likewise, you can uh, draw risk profiles for your organization and you can identify what is the most sensitive uh, variable. Whether it may be a price or for a one organization it may be the interest rate, for the other organization it may be the exchange rate. Right? So you need to identify uh, which uh, variable is having a greater impact to your value of the firm. If you have identified that one, then you need to focus on that particular uh, variable and you need to reduce that risk. You need to do some uh, techniques. You can use derivatives, right, to minimize that risk. Okay, now... Uh, Now, as example, we'll say 
uh, agricultural products company that has a larger scale wheat farming operation. Because wheat prices can be very, uh, very, volatile, very volatile, this will affect the value of the crop. Okay, now this is the example. The product is wheat, agricultural product. And we are looking uh, from the point of view of the producer. Okay. Uh, so what is the relationship between uh, prices and the value of the firm of seller? So what will happen if that prices are increasing, when we assume prices are increasing, is it favorable or unfavorable for the seller? Favorable, right? Because with the increased selling price, you can generate more cash flows. If you can generate more cash flows, your firm value will increase. Okay. So by looking at this description, we can identify it should be a positive relationship. Right. It should be a positive relationship. So how can you show a positive relationship by using a graph? Now here, this is risk profile of the producer. Now for y-axis, we are here, delta V, that means change in firm value, right? Change in firm value. And this axis, change in prices, right? Change in market prices. What has happened to the market prices of wheat? Now, you can see this change in prices, it has gone to the, that means negative and positive. Why? When we are talking about change in prices, it may be a negative one, right? Now, I assume price has, uh, original price is 10, new price is 5, the change is minus 5, okay? So, when we are talking about price fluctuations, we, when we are, and when we are drawing in that in the graph, we have to consider both minus figures as well as positive figures. When we are talking about the change in value of the firm, same, right? Assume uh, original firm value is 1000, now it has become 900. Change in value is minus 100. So we, can, we have to plot that data point in the minus sign. So that's why we, when, when we are drawing a risk profile, we have to incorporate both plus figures and minus figures. Okay. Right. So are you agree with the conclusions that we have derived in slide number 13? Yes, we have identified that there is a positive relationship. Okay. Now you can see this uh, curve is up, this uh, graph line is upward sloping, right? Upward sloping always right now. Uh, I'll come to this uh, black color line later, right? So, uh, right now, uh, we try to identify some points here, okay. Now, uh, this graph is showing, that means uh, in uh, slide number 14, green color line, it shows a positive relationship, right? Okay, now here positive, positive relationship indicate when When prices are increasing, right, uh, firm value also increasing, right? If or when uh, prices are decreasing, firm value also decreasing. So this is the positive relationship, right? Okay. Now, uh, <coughs> if we go.
go back to the right now look at this now here we are having two graph two uh, lines right green color at one and uh, black color line okay now assume uh, this is for a uh, g company and this is for b company okay now if you think these are risk profiles for two companies right so variables are the variable is change in prices or so price fluctuations so which company is having the greatest impact or which company is more sensitive to the price changes yes uh, hope i will get your answer from online use online uh, participants which company is the more sensitive yeah g company right because it's the the line curve is steep right shape of the curve right the flatter uh, that mean flatter curves are representing less sensitive right so if you uh, okay now assume now this is the change in price okay so first i'll concern about the black company so this much is the change now i'll concern about green company now can you see same price change in price is same right but you can see the change in firm value is different right g company is having more change with the same level of fluctuations in price therefore now in this case g company should pay more attention on price fluctuation right so they they can enter into forward contracts they can buy a futures they can do some uh, other techniques to reduce the risk of price fluctuations then b company clear so that is uh we have uh, we have derived that conclusion by looking at the shape of the curves right b company and g company here this two risk profiles of two company related to price fluctuations right okay <clears throat> now uh, assume you have given some data right it may be uh, like this now uh, okay you may uh, give the value of the firm and price right price 10 value of the firm 100 uh, price 20 value of the firm is 150 likewise assume you have given this type of data set and from this data set you may have uh, you may ask to develop a risk profile for this company okay now if that is the case can you develop a risk profile by using by using this data do you need to do some adjustment assume this is the original data set you have given price and you have given value yes how you are going to develop the risk profile can you uh, draw the risk profile by using this data no because this is relating to price and value you need to find delta p and delta v right so don't forget that one you need to find delta v p and delta v now here delta 10 and 50 right likewise you can find the other data points and you can develop this one right otherwise if you use this data okay it will be like this because you will be not getting minus figures here because price is not become a minus figure anyway right you are not getting minus 10 rupees no okay therefore you may confuse with this if you have given a original data set like this you need to find out these two columns and you have to uh, build uh, develop the risk profile right 
Okay, so hope you are clear with the risk profile. Yes. So with that, we can move to the next slide. Okay. This is about the positive relationships. Right. So I'll give you a task. Can you develop the risk profile for the buyer? Right. So these are the two axes. Uh, can you just imagine now uh, earlier one we have developed that is the risk profile for the seller now think about the buyers point of view okay now why we should think about this both side because we may be the buyer or we may be the seller right so we should develop our risk profile because I am also if I am the buyer I am also having my company so I need to identify risk profile of my company. If I am the seller, if I am the producer, I need to develop my own risk profile. Therefore, we should know about both. Okay. Now, assume you are the buyer. Same example, be it buyer. Then, uh, what is, what can be the risk profile? What is the shape? You just, uh, the online users, you can just uh, give me a hint on the uh, risk profile. Uh, Physical participants, yes, you can draw. Yeah, okay, good. I got answer. Yeah, other way around, right? Or negative relationship. Okay, so it is like this. Uh, as you okay assume that is a straight line okay um, yeah. you can see a negative relationship okay why it is negative relationship when prices are increasing it's not good for the buyer because you will have to pay high price right it will increase your cost therefore when uh, prices are increasing that is not that when your firm value will decrease right firm value will decrease so that's why with the in, uh, increase in uh, uh, prices the your values have gone to negative side right when prices are at the negative side that means when prices are reducing that's why uh, change has become minor right you can see the firm values are on the positive side clear okay so that is from the point of view buyer buyer's point of view okay now you can see uh, in the case of a price fluctuations the both buyer and seller are facing a risk due to this uncertainty of prices so here what we can do how we can reduce Okay, if we draw this buyer's risk profile and the seller's risk profile together, it will be like sorry, it will be like this. The green color line, uh, green color line is for the seller, and the red color one is for the buyer. Right? Totally opposite way. When one when one is uh, increasing firm value, other other parties decreasing their firm value, right? Both buyer and seller are facing op totally opposite risk profiles. Okay. Now with this understanding, we can go to the next slide and I think uh, and understand how we can reduce this risk. Reducing this exposure. If these two firms get together, then much of the risk can be eliminated. Buyer and seller simply agreed at set dates in the future. The producer will deliver a certain quantity of wheat and the buyer will pay a set price. Right? So this is the foundation. Now we are coming for the forward contracts. So this is the basic foundation for the forward contracts. Okay, now what they can do is since they are facing a totally uh, opposite risk profiles but they what they can do is they can get together and decide a price right okay i will deliver 
this much of quantity in three months, you, you pay this much of price to me. Right? Now, that is with that agreement, you can reduce, not eliminate it. I, I will explain why I am using that reduce instead of elimination. You can reduce the price fluctuate, risk of price fluctuations to some acceptable level. Okay? Because whatever the market price, you are both seller and buyer are locked in a price right whatever the market price your, your transaction will do at the agreed price clear okay once the agreement is signed both firms will have locked in the agreed price as long as the agreement is in effect and both of their risk profiles with regard to bid prices will be completely flat during that time what do you mean by a flat risk profile? Yes. Completely flat risk profile. How you can draw that one? Delta V, delta P. Yes. completely flat. It's like a horizontal line. What's the meaning of this? Why it has become a flat curve? Yes. Whatever the market price, there can be differences in market price. Market price can be changed, but whatever the market price, whether it is increasing or decreasing, your firm value is this much. Right? It will not change because you are locked in a price. This is right. Your firm value is this much. Clear? So that is why we are saying with this kind of agreement, you can have a com completely flat profile. But in the, if we think about the practical situation, right? So that's why I said we cannot eliminate this risk 100%. We can reduce. If we think about uh, uh, okay, let's see to the next slide. In reality, firm that hedges financial risk usually won't be able to create a complete risk, uh, flat risk profile. But in practical situations. Actually, we cannot uh, achieve this complete risk profile. Now, why? Let's say now, since this is agricultural product, we have another uncertainty regarding the output, right? Uh, okay. Let's say uh, we are expecting, let's say, five thousand. Uh, let's say 5,000 tons of wheat, right? But actual, it may be 5,200, right? So you have a no problem with, uh, 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 with relating to the contract. You can fill, fulfill the obligations of the full uh, contract. You can deliver 5,000 quantity, 5,000 tons of wheat to that particular buyer without any problem. But the, here, you have a, another problem. Why? You have excess 200. Right? This excess 200, you can sell in the open market. In open market, price fluctuations are there. Clear? Therefore, Still, you are facing a price fluctuation risk to that additional 200. Now, assume the other side, you are expected by 100, but actually is 4,800. This was also a possible scenario, right? Because we are talking about agricultural products. Okay? We are talking about agriculture. Products. You are expected 5,000 tons, but you are ended up with only 4,800 tons. Now here, what is the risk? 
can you say to the buyer, hey, look at, I have only 4,800, can you accept? No, because you have, you have an agreement. So whether you are having 4,800, you have to give 5,000 to the buyer. So what, what is the uh, condition you are facing now? You have to find another 200 from outside. Right? And you have to make 5,000 and give to the buyer. This outside 4,000 or 200 is having price fluctuations. Clear? Therefore, but anyway, uh, because of this agreement, in the first situation, you are you have a safeguard to this 5,000. Right? If you have, if you don't have any agreement, you are exposed to a risk for this total 5,200 tons. But because of this agreement, now you are safe with 5,000, but other 200, you cannot do anything. Okay? Now, with relating to this 4,800, okay? Now, uh, if, since you are having an agreement, right? You can sell this 4,800 at the agreed price. Otherwise, you have to sell the total uh, for total 4,800 at a lesser price if the prices at, if prices are decreasing in the general market. Okay? So likewise, because of this kind of agreement, now you can see we have eliminated, we have reduced the risk, not eliminate, sorry, we have reduced the risk, but not eliminated. Right? So why we are not saying we have not eliminated due to this part. Due to this part and with this part. Okay? But we have reduced the risk to some level. Clear? Okay. So this is the basic for forward contract. Okay. Now... Uh, Now we are moving to the forward contract with that basic understanding. Now we are coming to the derivatives. First one, first type of derivatives is forward contract. Okay. Now uh, earlier also we have learned this definition. Forward contract is a legally binding agreement between two parties calling uh, for the sale of an asset or product in future. That future date is we call as the settlement date at a price we call that price as the forward price okay agreed on today so we are agreeing this today but the transaction will uh, will happen in future 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 date okay the buyer of the contract will benefit if prices increase because buyer will have locked in a price in a lower price. Okay. Now, when market prices are increasing, in that condition, for uh, the buyer of the forward contract is benefiting. Right. Now, assume they have agreed on price 50. Right. But market prices are 70. If there is no agreement, the buyer will have to buy at 70 rupees. But because of the forward contract, now they, he can buy at 50 rupees. So he will have a benefit of 20 rupees. Right? So that is how buyer is benefiting. Similarly, seller wins if prices fall because a higher selling price has been locked. If you think about the seller side, he will have a benefit if prices are decreasing. Right? Now assume they have agreed at a price of 50 but market price is 30 because if there is no any agreement the seller have to sell at 30 rupees but because of this agreement now he can sell at 50 rupees now in that case you can see the seller is having a 20 rupees benefit because of this contract right Therefore, one party will benefit at the expense of the other. So, forward contract is a zero-sum game. Right? It's a 
zero sum game. So I'll explain how this, uh, what is the mean of this zero sum game. Uh, okay, now here we'll just try to understand a simple forward contract. Let's say two parties are A and B, right? So uh, we'll say A will deliver uh, 5,000 units and B will, uh, let's say price is 10, right? Forward price is 10. Now, uh, assume spot price, spot price or let's say actual market price, price is 20. Okay. Now, he is the seller, B is the buyer. Assume market price is 20. Okay. Now, seller, what is the situation of the seller? Now, who is winning? Who is benefiting from this uh, forward contract? Market price is 20. Yes. Who is benefiting? Buyer is benefiting. Why buyer is benefiting? Yeah. They can purchase at 10 rupees, otherwise, he has to pay 20 rupees, right? Therefore, buyer is having a benefit of how much the benefit? 10 rupees. Here, 10 rupees means the difference between with difference 20 minus 10, right? Not the uh, forward price. Okay. 10 into 5,000 units. This is the benefit. Seller. Seller is losing, right? 10 into 5,000 units. Sorry. Uh, now here, uh, uh, 5,000 unit and 10 rupees again the difference. So what is the sum? Zero. So that is why we are saying forward contract is a zero sum game. Right? One is benefiting. Uh, when one buyer is benefiting, seller is losing. When a seller is benefiting, buyer is losing. Right? So that is the nature of forward contracts. Okay? So that's why we are telling that these forward contracts are zero sum game. Okay. Now we have to develop another type of profile. Earlier we developed the risk profile. So with the forward contract, when we are entering into a forward contract, we can develop develop another type of profile which we call as a payoff profile. A plot showing the gains and losses that will occur on a contract as a result of unexpected price changes. Now here we are. The, with the forward contract, now we know we have locked in a price, but we can identify what are the benefits or what are the profits and losses due to this forward contract. Now, in the earlier case, the buyer is having 10 rupee benefit. The seller is having 10 rupee loss. Right? So, now we are in the payoff profile, we are concerning about Profits and losses to the buyer and seller due to this forward contract. Okay. Right. Now look at this one. Now you have two graphs. 
payoff profile. Let's concern about the blue color line, that is buyer's perspective. Now you may confuse with the risk profile and the payoff profile because now we have in the earlier we have drawn two graphs to the risk uh, to the seller and buyer, right? They look same, but don't confuse with this. We have if we think about uh, seller and buyer, and if we think about the forward contract, we can develop four graphs: two risk profiles and two payoff profiles. Okay, now we look what is the meaning of this payoff profile. Okay, now look at the buyer's perspective. Payoff profile is upward sloping, positive relationship. So, what is the meaning of this? Again, two variables are same change in prices, change in firm value. Okay, now you can see to the buyer we have a positive relationship between change in prices and change in value if we have entered into a forward contract. Okay, so we can develop payoff contract if we have entered into a pay, uh, forward contract only. Otherwise, we cannot develop a payoff profile. Okay, now how, why it is a positive or uh, upward sloping? Why it is upward sloping? Yes, to the buyer, when market prices are increasing, it's good for the buyer, right? Because they can purchase at a lesser prices due to the forward contract. If there is no forward contract, they have to purchase, they have to buy at a higher prices. Because of that savings, firm value will increase. Clear? So that is why to the buyer, payoff profile is a upward sloping curve, right? The simple meaning is this, uh, is when market prices are increasing, it, it gives a benefit or profits for the buyer due to the forward contract, right? Clear? Right, now look at the seller's perspective. Payoff profile, it's downward sloping. Downward sloping curves always represent a negative relationship. When one variable is increasing, another variable is decreasing. Now you can see, when prices are increasing, right? When market prices are increasing. So we are in a positive side when market prices are increasing what have, what has happened to the uh, value of the firm it is in the so it is in the negative side why if there is no forward contract seller could could sell this uh, product at a higher price but because of this forward contract, they have to, the seller has to uh, sell at the agreed price, which is which is a lesser price than the market price. Okay, but if market prices are decreasing, market prices are decreasing. We are in the negative side of the uh, prices. Then it, the firm value is in a positive side. Why? Because of the for, because of this forward contract, now seller can sell this product at a higher price, right? If there is no forward contract, seller has to pay at, uh, sell at a less market price. Okay. Therefore, though since we are having a chance to sell at a higher price, firm value will increase. Okay. Now, th therefore, now you may con you have to understand this very well risk profile and a payoff profile. Now next we are going to draw risk, risk profile and a payoff profile of the buyer in one graph and risk profile and the payoff, uh, payoff profile of the seller. Okay. So, uh, so uh, that means uh, 
before moving to that one, you need to understand this very well, right? Risk profile for the buyer and uh, buyer and seller, and payoff profile for the buyer and seller. Okay, so uh, we we'll have a short break and uh, discuss uh, the graph which we are putting payoff profile and risk profile together. Okay, right. Okay, uh, shall we start? <coughs> right, now uh, next slide we are going to check uh, right, risk profile and payoff profile of buyer's perspective. Right, now you can see the risk profile and uh, payoff profile are totally opposite to each other. Right, now risk profile is in red color to the buyer. Right, this profile uh, that is the plot change in prices and change in value without a without any contract right then payoff profile is change in price and change in value with the forward contract okay now uh, <clears throat> you can see the downward sloping curve we have converted into a upward sloping curve with this forward contract right with this forward contract now our concern is about the negative side now. Okay. Now you can see <coughs> this part. Right. Change in prices, the firm value is decreasing. We have converted that into a positive uh, place like this. Okay, with the forward contract. But anyway, the, that is for the uh, beneficial, beneficial side. As I said, this uh, forward contract is a zero sum game. When one is uh, winning, is benefiting, other is losing. Right now, here, uh, without the forward contract, you can see negative. It has converted to a uh, positive one. It has converted to a negative side with the forward contract because. That means due to this nature of the forward contract, zero sum game, right? When one is winning, other one is losing. Okay, then um, can you draw the seller's perspective? Risk profile and uh, payoff profile, just try. Now here, this is from the seller's perspective. Sometimes now for the examination, you may have asked to develop a, a risk profile and payoff profile uh, uh, for the uh, buyer and seller. The problem is you have to understand this is very much. Otherwise, if you confuse with the press profile and payoff profile, and if you confuse with the sellers and buyers perspective, then uh, right, you you will not get any marks. So you need to understand very very clearly risk profile and payoff profile of buyers and sellers. Okay, because all curves are look same, right? So that's why you may uh, confuse with these things. Okay. Now, seller's perspective, what is the risk profile? Yes, is it a positive or a negative? Risk profile, positive. Okay. This is risk profile. Okay. Because uh, for the seller, it is good that market prices are increasing it's good for the uh, seller because they can uh, earn more cash flows and payoff profile
So this is a straight line. So, payoff profile. Now again, as the uh, buyer, you can see uh, we have converted the negative impact, right, to a positive side with the forward contract. But on the other hand, due to this forward contract, we don't know, we may lose or we may win. But the thing is, the, we have fixed on a price, right? We know whatever the market price, we have to pay this much. We will receive this much. That part is fixed. It also, that means, if we know the, the amount that we are receiving or if we know the, the amount what we have to pay, if that is fixed, mean we are reducing some risk because we can pre-plan, no? That means we know that we will be receiving 5,000 tons in three months. Right, exactly 5,000 tons in three months. And we know we have to pay 5,000 into 10 rupees, 50,000 in three months. So from today onwards, we can plan to that. Right, we can plan our production process because we know the, the material will be 5,000 tons. So we don't have to bother about the input. Right, we don't have to go here and there to find out uh, the 5,000 tons because A will give us 5,000 tons. Right, and we know we have to pay exactly fifty thousand. We do, right, so we don't have to bother whether it will be a hundred thousand or whether it will be a twenty thousand. Yeah, it, if it's a higher amount, then yeah, it has a, a negative impact. But anyway, we know what will be the cash outflow before three months, right? So we can plan. We can plan our, our cash uh, cash flows. We can plan our production process, all the things in advance before three months. So it so that's why it said it will reduce a risk uh, up to a level, some level. Okay. Now this is risk profile and payoff profile of a seller. Right. Credit risk. What do you mean by credit risk? What do you mean by credit risk? Credit risk is we can say uh, it's a default risk. Right? Credit risk means uh, now as a, our as our previous example A and B, right? A will give five thousand tons and B will give fifty thousand rupees, right? Now A is facing a credit risk because he don't know whether that B, whether B will pay fifty thousand. Yeah, forward contract is a legally binding contract, but if the if if it give a lot of disadvantage to the buyer so it there is an incentive to default right there is a motivation to default this uh, agreement in that case uh, in forward contract we have credit risk because now one thing is no upfront cost to the contract what do you mean by upfront upfront cost Upfront cost means a, 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 it's like a margin. That means to enter into the agreement, you have to pay something, right? At the inception, uh, let's say you have to pay uh, 1,000 rupees to enter into the contract, right? If you want to enter into the contract, you have to pay 1,000 rupees, then you can enter into the contract. So that is the mean of upfront cost. Now for the forward contract, there is no upfront cost. You can, that means no initial cost. You can enter into the agreement at the uh, settlement date only cash flows are exchanging, right? Other than that, before that, no cash flows are involved in the contract, okay? So since there is no initial cost, okay, now assume uh, now for the futures and for the options you have to pay something and enter into the contract in that case you have some sort of liability you know responsibility because you have pay 50000 if you default you will lo lose that one right uh, and for the forward contract there is no margin no initial margin right no upfront cost 
Forward contract is a financial obligation. Okay, now for the B, it's an obligation because in three months period of time, they, uh, B has to pay 50,000. It's an obligation. <clears throat> the party on the losing end of the contract has a significant incentive to default on the agreement. Right? Now, assume uh, you have locked, that means uh, forward price is 50 and market price is 10 for the buyer. Because of this forward contract, he has to pay 40 rupees additional, right? Because of the forward contract. If that is the case, it creates an incentive, opportunity, right? Motivation to default the agreement, okay? So, therefore, there is a credit risk in forward contracts, right? Okay, now, the forward contract is the... the initial stage right now here we call these things as financial engineering financial engineering means now here first you have uh, uh, discover forward contracts right when you are implementing these things you will uh, understand okay these are the problems issues then with those issues you are developing another type of uh, derivative right let's say uh, futures okay now it's same now next topic is futures you will understand now it's developed based on the forward contract it's a, a advanced version of a forward contract right more standardized right you can exchange free likewise right and the now the other thing is options next one options means if you are if you like option means you have option if you like you can proceed otherwise you can exit okay so likewise we, now that is we call as financial engineering you are developing you are adding some features and you are developing new types of uh, financial instruments okay right so these things are uh, evolving right okay so with that we can move to the futures contract okay we have talked about forward contracts now the, the in uh, investment and portfolio management, you will be doing some calculations, right? You are developing, uh, that means you are finding what is the forward price, all the things, right? Those calculation part will be covered in the investment and portfolio. Here you will be learning some theoretical aspects, right? Okay. So with this knowledge, you can continue that uh, lecture very well because you have a basic understanding. Okay. Now futures contract. Same as the forward contract with some exceptions, right? It's also a same like a futures contract. That means you are agreed to deliver some, uh, let's say, product or some amount of currency, right? At a future date at, at the agreed rate. But here there are some differences or exceptions. Now these exemptions are the differences between forward and futures. If you have asked to distinguish forward contract from a future contract. So these are the reasons. These are the points, right? Standardize. Standardize. Now here forward contract, you now assume you can enter into any amount. Let's say you are entering into 5,525 tons, right? Because you are entering that Contra uh, forward contract with A and B. You A is knowing that my other part is B. B is knowing the other part is A. Right? And you can enter into a, any amount. And you can uh, that maturity period. Right? It may be uh, you can enter into a forward contract that uh, future period is falling uh, after 21 days or after one month or after one and a half month, right? It, you can decide because A and B can decide. They can customize, okay? But here in future, contract size is, now in next slide, I have uh, uh, put, I have uh, extracted some uh, information related to this standardized uh, component, right? That means, Delivery month, that means its maturity date, is already decided. It may be April, May, right? Uh, contract size is, now assume you are entering into a, a agricultural uh, futures contract. Okay, that means if you buy one future means, 
that run future include 5000 tons right you can buy one future but in the uh, futures exchange right that means uh, we will be talking about that th those things later the amount is already decided one future means 5000 tons okay you cannot you cannot enter into a forward contract to buy 5525 tons no if that is the case you have to buy two futures 5000 5000 right okay that size is standardized if it is for a currency right one future means 62500 dollars two futures means 62500 into two right and delivery month is uh, predetermined okay that means and you cannot you cannot enter into a future contract okay uh, it with i will deliver in 21 days no if you are buying a futures contract you have to adhere to those delivery uh, month of that uh, futures exchange right okay it may be april if you are buying uh, futures you know uh, uh, futures which is delivery month is april you know you have to pay uh, ca cash in April and you will receive money in April, right? That means delivery months are already decided, okay? So that is the mean of standardized uh, uh, cr uh, criteria, right? Then gains and losses are realized each day rather than on the settlement day, okay? So you will be understanding when we are moving ahead, right? But here uh, I need to uh, explain this different uh, that means differentiation fact, uh, features from forward contracts and futures. Gains and losses are realized each day rather than on the settlement day. We call this feature as mark into market. Right? Okay, now assume you have purchased three months future. That means today you have purchased a future. Right? Delivery or settlement uh, maturity period is after three months. Okay? Now, every day, now in forward contract, you have to wait until the three months, until uh, uh, you are uh, the, until you are reaching the settlement day to understand whether you have gained or loss. But here, throughout that three months period, every day you are calculating gains and losses. Right? Now, these uh, futures are, that mean we have a futures exchange like share market right now you can freely exchange these futures anyone can buy a future but you don't know who is your other party because you are contacting a uh, futures exchange like you, you go to the share market right you don't know the other partner you go to the share market and you can purchase or you can sell your share likewise you can go to the uh, futures exchange and you can buy or sell your futures right so likewise, now when these are trading every day, right, the settlement price, that means what is the price at the end of each day? By looking at the settlement day, right, the, the like, uh, exchange will decide, okay, whether this person is, has earned or lost, okay? Right, now uh, you will realize, you will understand that very well when we are uh, doing some calculations, right? An upfront cost. That means before entering into a futures contract, you need to pay a margin. We call it as initial margin. You have to pay 10,000 or let's say it is around 2% to 20% from the uh, contract value, right? So you need to pay a margin to enter into the contract, okay? Right. So these are the uh, different that mean how uh, forward contracts are different from futures right now futures we can identify two types commodity futures and financial futures now in financial futures we can uh, identify stocks bonds and currencies right and commodity prices anything other than a financial asset okay it may be agricultural product right you can have uh, you can buy a future for oil price, oil, right, crude oil, or you can buy a future for corn, right, or wheat, okay. So likewise, 
uh, we have two types of futures commodity uh, futures and financial future now these futures are that mean uh, this is a very much popular uh, financial instrument or uh, derivatives in other countries right but uh, in sri lanka this is not a uh, uh, widely used one right okay now look at this one <laughs> right now this cme right cme uh, group means uh, chicago mercantile exchange right like we are having colombo stock exchange right now that is for shares now for futures also there are uh, accepted uh, exchanges right now here chicago mercantile exchange is one of the futures exchange right in uh, next slides we will be learning few, few uh, futures exchange now here look at this one the uh, first one <coughs> weekly grain options contract specification okay now here you can uh, hope uh, you can read this the first one is contract size one corn future contract now this is for corn right corn that means agricultural product you know the corn right one future means 5000 bushels right one thousand one future means five thousand bushels then the uh, price right uh, six point two five dollars per contract okay six uh, that means the price is already decided then look at the expiration dates first friday of the month right second friday of the month third friday of the month so these are the expiration dates of the futures okay if you want to that mean if you, uh, to mature a, a particular future you need to wait until the first friday of the month or second friday of the month before that you can't do anything you need to wait until the uh, expiration date right so everything is determined even quality of the product now if you think about the uh, agricultural futures the the uh, size of the contract the value of the contract and the quality of the product right especially for the agricultural product that means that product should be in this quality everything is predetermined so if you if you have purchased a, a futures for agricultural product you know the size of the product, uh, size of the uh, future, and you know the uh, maturity period, and you know the quality. Everything is determined, right? From this futures exchange, right? You can enter into a futures contract if your product is matching with those specifications. Otherwise, no, because you don't know the person, you don't know who is the buyer. Now, in the case of forward contract A and B. Uh, a no b is the other party b no a is the other party but here futures are we are buying and selling through exchange right if i buy a futures contract i don't know who will be the uh, producer who will give me the product therefore all uh, buyers and all sellers should adhere to a specific quality specification right okay the other one is about uh, soya beans futures, right? Now contract size one soya bean futures uh, again five thousand bushels. Likewise, you can enter. That means there are futures for crude oil and wheat, right? Uh, gold, uh, mean uh, aluminium, right? That means uh, materials and basic products now like now this is the specification now you can see the heading is contract specification 
right? So if you go to this uh, CME group website, right? Uh, Chicago Mercantile Exchange website, you can see these things. So I have extracted this information from their website. That means anyone that means because anyone can purchase, right? So if the that means guidelines are given, how you should trade, right? What how that means uh, for the investor, uh, the all guidelines are given. So this is the standardization. So that I put these uh, two things just to explain the standardization feature of futures contracts. Okay, right. Futures exchanges. A futures exchange or futures market is a central financial exchange where people can trade standardized futures contracts. This is just like a stock exchange, right? This is just like a stock exchange. Now here in, uh, these are some examples, Chicago Board of Trade, CBOT, Chicago Mercantile Exchange, CME, London International Financial Futures Exchange, right? Okay, so, so these are the abbreviations. Uh, you can find this thing. You can go to any of these websites, right? And you can find some additional information. Okay, now here, uh, as I said earlier, uh, we have uh, categorized these futures into two, commodity uh, futures and financial futures. Now here I have put some examples. Now, first one is for cocoa, right? Uh, commodity future that is for cocoa and here exchange uh, okay C, uh, CSCE that means uh, coffee sugar and cocoa exchange right and FOX, FOX that is for futures and options exchange in UK right and look at the other one for aluminium right uh, that is for uh, COMEX, that means Commodity Exchange in New York. And the third one, uh, Commodity Futures, that is for crude oil, right? IPE, IPE means International Petroleum Exchange, right? And you can find crude oil futures in NYMX, that means um, New York Mercantile Exchange, right? So you can buy uh, these commodity futures now here I have put few examples from this exchange. And if you look at financial futures, now US Treasury bill, right? Other than the, the commodity futures, Treasury bill, it's a financial a financial future. So you uh, you can uh, buy a financial future of US Treasury bill uh, from IMM, right? That means International Monetary Market. Uh, one of the futures exchange and if you want to enter into a financial futures for sterling power right you can buy a future from uh, 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 London International Financial Futures Exchange right so likewise you can find uh, many uh, accepted futures exchange exchanges in worldwide even india also they are having but in sri lanka this is not a uh, popularized uh, area right okay <clears throat> now for these uh, let, let, as example let's say for the commodity futures financial futures that standardization feature is there right now for cocoa one uh, a fee, one future is equal to this much of terms Right for aluminium, one future is equal to this much of let's say uh, kilograms or whatever. Right, crude oil this much of barrels. Likewise, okay. <clears throat> and treasury bills and sterling is also same. One future equal let's say uh, twelve thousand five hundred sterling pounds. Okay. So likewise, the amount is uh, or uh, predetermined. Okay. Now here, how we can uh, hedge our risk with futures contract? Now the thing is, uh, we have to maintain an account with the broker so that gains and losses can be credited or debited each day as a part of the mark into market process. Okay? Now we in the futures, we are maintaining an account, right? 
now as as now as example say i i am i i'm buying a future first i need to pay the margin initial margin right and i am doing this uh, transaction through a broker right then broker will open 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 an account for me right then he will uh, credited the in initial margin which i have paid and at the every day right at the every day he will settle right mark into market process um right now let's see like this okay. now uh in the next slide i have put an example right then you you can identify how this how this is working now before that i'll explain this margin a deposit made by the prospective trader with the broker losses are deducted from the margin deposit right now we have to pay a, that mean there is an upfront cost of the futures uh, before entering into the market we have to pay a, a margin right after that only we can uh, proceed with the uh, futures so when we are earning losses they will deduct from the margin so we have uh, three margins first one is initial margin that means deposit that the trader must make before trading any futures before entering into the futures contract we have to pay it may it, it normally it's ranging from 2% to 20% from the contract value right so we have to pay that then maintenance margin when margin reaches a minimum maintenance level the trader is required to bring the margin back to the in, back to its initial level the maintenance margin is generally about 75 uh, of the initial margin now let's say uh, the initial margin is 1000 rupees right before entering into the futures contract we need to pay 1000 rupees okay so when we are earning losses right the broker will deduct that loss from our margin okay now assume we have uh, earned a hundred loss uh, from day one then thousand minus hundred then our margin is 900 okay day two again we are we have a profit because these prices are fluctuating right prices are fluctuating now uh, now in the forward contract the the problem is we have to wait until we are reaching the settlement date but during that period prices may increase or decrease but we don't know right if the at the settlement date final the price is price has decreased then we are earning the loss but the, throughout the three months period the prices are fluctuated no so, uh, maybe in the first month uh, we may earn a profit but we are at the end of the third month, right? The, we, we have.